So uh, I'm, I'm here representing the Science Visualization Lab um, at UTM. Uh, this lab was established, gosh, eight years ago now, I think, um, with, with a focus on examining how we learn from visuals. No surprise there. Um, so we've been looking at the role of representation uh, in, in fostering understanding as well. Um, the Science Visualization Lab examines the role of visual complexity in learning. And then finally, we're very interested in um, creating standards of practice within the visualization design community. Uh, the majority of my work has been done in collaboration with uh, Gail McGill, who is based at Harvard Medical School. And so I'm going to take you on a rapid fire tour through some of our past projects to provide a context for what it is that we're doing right now. So when we undertake illustrations, animations, interactive uh, tools, we have an enormous toolkit available to us. And that includes a lot of variety, particularly in, in the modality and in, in the way in which we choose to represent structures. So whether it be 2D or 3D, static, dynamic, um, interactive, schematic or photorealistic, and and we have many different purposes as well for communicating, whether that purpose be more didactic in nature or editorial, predictive or exploratory. So with that in mind, um, the Science Visualization Lab has been really interested over the past eight years in looking at how we use visuals, in particular, how we design visuals. So we've been looking at things like increased visual detail, or in, in the case of biology education, which we're primarily focused on in the introduction of things like random motion. So here's a very early experiment that looked at uh, additive layering of details and complexity to determine whether or not the end, end viewer would be able to understand a highly complex animation. Um, basic takeaway from this is yes, they can. However, when you use selective color coding, um, those elements which are, are actually part of the whole, all those water molecules and larger uh, molecules um, are assigned to the background by students. And that's a problem. So we've also looked at color coding in a more in-depth way. So for example, looking at selective color coding, versus a transition from selective to full color and then full color. And we, in, in designing a study like this, we would be looking at whether or not full color is just too uh, overstimulating for students, whether or not taking the middle ground and introducing color slowly through transition is a better way to introduce complexity. And what we found here was in fact, uh, the viewers really interpret transition as change. So whereas we think of transition as bridging from one shot to another, uh, it may be misinterpreted by the end viewer. Additionally, we've been looking at things like attention cueing and how that can be used to uh, convey complex information. So for example, in this case, just selective color coding or internal color cues, um, velocity vectors, uh, heat maps, and all of this is done within the context of biology education. And again, we're just trying to understand how it is we can, can use the tools in our toolkit to convey complexity. And to date, we've had some successes, but we've had as many failures, I, I would say. Uh, we've also turned to looking at things like interactive design. So again, looking at modality. So this is some work by Matan Bersan, um, which examines um, bridging representations while teaching various stere stereochemistry concepts. So from three-dimensional representation representations to two-dimensional drawings using augmented reality. Um, another example is the work by Andrea Gauthier, whom you'll see present later this morning, which looks at game-based learning and how it is that productive negativity or failing levels in gaming over and over again until you get it right, how it is that that can actually um, foster understanding. And, and this has been one of the more successful studies that does bridge that gap um, and reconcile or remediate misconceptions in biology. We've also looked at inquiry-based learning. This is work by uh, Annie Tseng, uh, which looks at 
how, how we can remediate misconceptions around generation time and natural selection. And so this was us, um, the, the modules were designed by Annie Tsang and this study was undertaken by an undergraduate uh, ROP research opportunity student. So this was a very interesting study and, and was very effective in remediating misconceptions. We've also been looking at things like metaphor. This is work by Jenny Chin, looking at how how we can convey the ideas around molecular scale um, to general audiences. And this led to another study led by Michael Corrin uh, called BioLeap, where we looked at how we can encourage undergraduate biology students to build critical thinking skills around the imagery that they see, bridging between representations again and thinking about how accurate the representations are that they're looking at in their textbooks. So finally, we've also looked at trying to bridge the gap between research and practice by um, developing principles for the depiction of molecular environments and behaviors uh, in an attempt to improve the visualization of these phenomena. And so these were generated or derived from the animation principles established by Disney. And um, we converted those to principles that would relate more to molecular environments. So this was done with, um, again, with Gail McGill and with Stuart Jansen, who's with Biocinematics, he presented yesterday. Um, so all of this is to say that the more we learn, the less we know. And that's, that's what I've come to realize, that the more we study about visualization and the more we probe and interrogate uh, the visuals we design, the less we actually know about how they work. Um, we have a wonderful tradition in our industry and in education around mentorship and teaching. On the left, we have Isle Ross studying with Max Bradle. It looks like that pelvis study that they do at Hopkins still, I think, to this day, which was pretty amazing. And on the right, we have Michael Corrin uh, reminding us all to name our layers in Photoshop. Um, so we have this wonderful tradition but it's all practice-based. It's what we call craft-based knowledge. So we apply all of this to work we do when we join industry, but there is, there does exist a very big gap between research and practice, and that is research and educational psychology versus practice and visualization design. And that is because it is very difficult to reconcile something like this on the left, which comes from a study by Richard Mayer, uh, versus a a fantastic illustration on the, on the right by Hangman. And, and the problem is that the educational psychology doesn't reflect the work we do in the real world. And the work that we do in the real world is not informed by findings in educational psychology. Now, there are notable exceptions to the rule of the, the mayor example on the left. And you'll see those today with the wonderful work uh, interrogating animation by Kevin Wee and, and the work that Andrea Gauthier is doing at the uh, Knowledge Lab. Um, so this brings me to where we are right now, which is an effort to bridge the gap between the educational research and representation, what we do in biomedical communications, um, and also in instruction so that people who use instruction could easily be industry. The people who use our visualizations benefit optimally from them. So in attempting to bridge that gap, um, we have formed uh, a collective, so to speak, a network called Visibly, uh, which looks at educational research, science visualization, and biology instruction. And this is Visibly is a collaboration of University of Toronto. It's a partnership, actually, between University of Toronto, University of California, Davis, and Harvard Medical School. And that is working with Gail McGill and Susan Davis from UC Davis, uh, the, the best collaborators one could ever hope to have. So what Visibly aims to do is to develop assessment protocols that are better suited to measuring the efficacy of animation and interactive uh, stimuli, and then translate those educational research findings into meaningful guidelines for, for practitioners. Uh, and providing resources and trainings for, for all of these three communities. Um, so briefly, um, we conducted a needs assessment uh, between September 2019 and December 2020 um, throughout COVID. Uh, and, and this was led primarily by Farah Hamadeh, to whom we owe a huge debt of gratitude for conducting many of these interviews or leading them. And th this needs assessment provided us some insights into what biology instructors, again, you could think of industry here, what they want, which is really they, they need 
animation that they can pull apart and use specifically for their needs. So they don't necessarily want these intact packages. They would like to be able to also find resources that they don't have to pay a fortune for because they're recognizing that students pay a lot for their education. The visualization design community wants to be more involved at, at the outset in the development of visualizations rather than being the hand to draw this for me. As well, the visualization community wants access to the research. That's a big problem, not having access to the research. Um, many of it exists behind paywalls. And then finally, the educational psychology community in an ideal world would like to have access to high quality stimuli and to the person who developed it so that they can make modifications as they go. And this is a really tall order. It's really difficult to achieve. Um, following our needs assessment, uh, we conducted a co-creation workshop that was led by Bridgeable. And, and that was quite an undertaking that even now we're still trying to reflect upon and absorb and, and much of what that co-creation taught us is in some ways we can't bridge this gap, but in some ways we can create opportunities for collaboration with these groups. Um, and, and that leads me to my pitch now, which is that uh, Visibly is going to be looking for a research associate or postdoc, whichever comes first in the very near future. Um, so I'll be advertising that. As well, we have room for a PhD student. And what we would like to do is create some really high quality stimuli for the best educational psychologists in the world, many of whom we've had the opportunity to work with, um, to create access to open open access research for the visualization design community and engage them in that, and also to create really useful educational material. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. I, I tried to keep things short so that I, I wouldn't go uh, over. Um, and if, if you are at all interested in either joining Visibly or in uh, becoming more directly involved in this initiative, please do not hesitate to contact me. Good morning to you. It's uh, well towards dinner time for me. I'm joining from Leamington Spa, England, but it's really nice uh, to be back at the Uncon. I've, I've missed it. Um, and yeah, today I'd like to share with you uh, the results of a recent study currently uh, in publication uh, that looked at how to guide children's learning behaviors, specifically their stopping and thinking behaviors um, using interaction and visual design. So this study was part of the UNLOCK project, which was a neuroscience-driven game-based learning project uh, in partnership between uh, Birkbeck University of London and the University College London, UCL, where, where I'm based, uh, and was funded by the Education Endowment Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. Uh, so the basic neuroscience concept is really simple here. So children develop naive misconceptions and beliefs as they interact with the world, right? And these are especially common in math and science. So for instance, they see that dolphins and fish have many similar physical characteristics. They live in the same habitat. So they might intu intuitively classify uh, dolphins and whales and other uh, mammals as fish. Or in math, they might develop a, a misconception that perpendicular lines consist only of straight vertical horizontal lines. So when lines are at an angle, like the purple ones you, you see here, those don't consist of uh, perpendicular uh, lines. So these types of uh, misconceptions are quite frequent, uh, common in children. So the problem is that even if children are taught the correct concept, which they are in schools, they often rush their answers and they pull these uh, naive, very embedded beliefs and long-standing beliefs to mind much more easily than the uh, correct knowledge. So the idea is that training children to actually just stop and think before answering will help them suppress that initial response and allow the correct answer to surface and therefore do better in, in maths and science. So before I joined the project, the team developed a game called Stop and Think, very creative, uh, to train kids to, as you guessed, stop and think before answering science and math problems. Uh, they tested it in a huge sample of nearly 7,000 children in the UK in a randomized control trial, where classes played the game as a 
as a whole group with the teacher leading the activity uh, in front of the class. Um, and that teacher would emphasize when the children should be stopping and thinking or not. And they played this for 12 minutes, three times a week for 10 weeks. Um, and the intervention was uh, relatively successful. Um, so children in the intervention group advanced by the equivalent of two months in science and one month in math over the group who received lessons as usual. So let me talk you through the basic format of how these stop and think activities uh, went. So it adopted this classic game show style trivia genre um, where the host would ask the class math and science questions. Um, now I should mention that in the original study, the neuroscientists didn't really care much about the, the look and feel of the game. So what you're seeing here is actually the new illustrations that I helped develop uh, once I joined, which I think is a, a small improvement, at least over what they had before. Um, so that kind of goes back to, to what Jody's talk about there being a very disconnect between practice and what happens in research. But, but regardless, uh, so in this original version, we uh, then enter this full screen mode where the question is narrated aloud to the children and this stop and think icon pulsates in the corner of the screen for five seconds or so uh, to demonstrate to the children that they should be stopping and thinking before answering. So this is a very short clip. Which of these animals are fish? So you can see that it just pulses continuously, persistently, and then it fades away. And then uh, once it does fade away, the, the screen becomes interactive and the class can then complete uh, the activity. So here where the, the class is incorrectly dragging the dolphin into the, the fish bucket. Um, so here, yeah, we got it incorrect. So the host says we can try again, which means we get to practice stopping and thinking again. And then if we get it incorrect a second time, we then hear some ideas from the contestants to help with our thinking. So one child has always has the correct idea. Another child will demonstrate the common misconception. Uh, and then a third child is always just wrong. And these are randomly uh, assigned for each problem. So then we again get to try to apply these new ideas while we're stopping and thinking. Um, and if we got it wrong again, we'd be told who had the right idea and allowed one last try, but usually by this time, hopefully, uh, we'll get it right and get to proceed to the bonus round, where we then uh, are given up to five additional questions related to that same counterintuitive concept. So the, the whole idea of the game is that uh, there's a batch of six questions in math, and then six questions in science, and that the classroom would complete these activities three times a week uh, for 10 weeks. And it's about six minutes in, in both the science and then the math. So 12 minutes total, three times a week. So not hugely innovative, but the innovative part was the, the, the stopping and thinking training itself. So the motivation behind the current study that I'm talking to you about today um, was whether or not individualized training would be more effective than training as a whole group because that software could in theory adapt to the needs of the individual child which is becoming more uh, of an issue with schools closing down during lockdown and needing to take these technologies home or, or used in different ways but i argued that before we even think about the adaptivity of the software we need to consider whether the current design of the interface is fit for purpose um, and it's, you know, it was not exactly designed conscientiously um, for children since the activity was being led by the teacher anyway, so she could, he or she could support the stopping and thinking uh, training. Um, yeah, and that's regardless of whether we fancy up the illustrations and make it more engaging. The question is still, does that, for instance, does that blinking uh, icon completely distract from the actual thinking activity? I know for me, when I first played it, I just stared at the icon until it went away and then I would engage. So that's counterproductive. Uh, so I, th I thought that that should be tested. So we decided to test uh, what other human computer interaction uh, features could promote and guide the children stopping and thinking behaviors more effectively uh, when the game was not guided by a teacher. So we looked at pre-attentive cues of motion of that icon, which was present in the original condition. 
uh, versus symbolic color of the icon. So to indicate when the child should be stopping and thinking. So using the kind of traffic light uh, symbolic color system. We looked at a readiness interaction mechanic where the children would have to press a button after stopping and thinking to state that they're committed and ready to, to answer. So this is kind of similar to, um, you know, raising your hand in the classroom when, when you, you think you're ready. Um, and then we looked at a rewards and penalty system where we hope that uh, incentives for correct answers might actually slow the children down and become more careful about how they would proceed. So we had three main objectives to determine how these HCI features promoted or interfered with uh, children's use of stop and think behaviors, to demonstrate how children's uh, behaviors are associated with their accuracy on the learning objectives, and to use the findings from these first two objectives to then conceptualize the design of an adaptive system for the game to support individual children's use of stopping and thinking behaviors. And we did this by comparing four versions of the game, which I'll discuss now. So the first condition was the motion condition. So this is essentially the same as the original game, but with the updated graphics. Which of these animals are fish? So you can see that it pulsates when it's narrated and then for a few seconds uh, after the fact. And then the, uh, then the child can interact with the system. The second condition, which we call motion plus, applied that same persistent pulsating motion, uh, but also incorporated the readiness indication mechanic through the I'm ready to answer button. Which of these animals are fish? So after the first few seconds, that stop and think icon flips and changes to an I'm ready to answer button, which the child has to think and determine that they are ready before then uh, continuing. The third condition called color plus uh, also incorporated that readiness indication button, but swapped the motion for symbolic color. So you'll see in this clip that red is used while the question is being narrated, Yellow is used uh, during those following few seconds to indicate that the child should be stopping and thinking. And then it turns green once they press the I'm ready button. Which of these animals are fish? And then they go and interact. And finally, the fourth condition called color plus reward builds on color plus by adding in token rewards after each correct answer and these bonus multipliers that are applied for sequences of correct answers, which then uh, goes back to, 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 to zero if you, if you get an answer wrong, which is the penalty. Here is a new question. Remember to stop and think about your answer. Which of these animals are fish? And I'll let it play through so that you can see the, the reward uh, being rewarded. So if we'll get it right. That is the correct answer. And that bonus multiplier there would uh, accrue as, as you go along. So not huge differences between them. So they're all very incremental just to see exactly the effect of each uh, small change. So we compared these uh, conditions in a small randomized trial with 45, seven to eight year old children. Uh, and we're, we tracked their gaze while they played uh, one science session and one math session. So for 12, about 12 minutes total. Excuse me. And so we measured their in-game performance. So whether or not they got uh, correct or incorrect answers. Uh, the average amount of time they spent stopping and thinking, where longer thinking is desirable. Uh, their eye fixations on the answer objects, again, where we deem longer total fix fixation duration would be better, that they're actually looking at these objects. Um, and then also their eye fixations on the stop and think icon and the I'm ready button when it flips, um, where we would think lower total fixations would be better because we don't want them just staring at that thing until it changes. So in our final analysis, we actually only focused on the science session because what we found was that the math 
session uh, topic that we choose chose um, was much too advanced for the children. They were only going to cover it in the next couple of months, and we were told otherwise. So it, it created uh, very different behaviors that were actually in, very interesting in and of themselves, but it didn't speak to any of the objectives of this study. So we focused only on the science, but I'm happy to discuss that uh, afterwards. Um, so overall, groups performed equally well. Uh, so the human, the HCI features ultimately had no final impact on learning or performance, but this is only in one session. So it'd be really interesting to test this over a much longer period, perhaps the full 10 week intervention uh, to see if differences would actually present over time. The average stopping and thinking was significantly higher in all conditions where children had uh, the readiness indication mechanic. So there is some evidence that getting children to state their commitment to being ready actually made them slow down and think longer. And by comparing motion plus and color plus uh, individually, or, or just those two, we can see that both motion and symbolic color cues appear to be equally effective at promoting these longer thinking times. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, however, if we then look at eye fixations on the answer objects, we see that there is no difference between motion and motion plus. Yet, we see that there's a significant difference between motion and color plus. So this would suggest that there is some sort of interaction effect between color and the readiness mechanic that the readiness mechanic doesn't uh, provide on its own uh, that will uh, draw the students' attention more towards those answer objects. And I suggest it's kind of this idea that perhaps the whole is greater than, than the sum of its parts. Interestingly, the reward feature appeared to really dampen the effectiveness of this color plus condition. And anecdotally, I can say that, that the children in this color plus reward condition uh, were, were just so excited about the concept of getting tokens, they kind of went a bit crazy and were looking all over the place and were just so excited that they weren't focused. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, and then finally, if we look at fixations on the stop and think icon and the I'm ready button, um, particularly the comparison between motion plus and color plus, these had the same results. So the motion didn't actually distract children like we thought it would. So this could be related to actually peripheral motion, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, children don't actually pay attention to peripheral things as much as uh, adults do. So were these behaviors related to in-game performance? Yes, the longer children spent stopping and thinking, the better they did. And there is some suggestion that the relationship was strongest in the color plus uh, condition, though there is no relationship between fixations and performance, which I'm happy to discuss later. Sorry, I'm rushing through. Uh, so the, the third objective was to, to see how we could uh, define an adaptive system for the game. So the first idea was to um, adjust the level of support or scaffolding. So for instance, if a child repeatedly ignored the icon, we could send in tutorial messages uh, <coughs> to repeatedly uh, repeat uh, during the gameplay and tell them when uh, or how to behave while these icons are in place. Secondly, we could configure the mandatory stop and think time. So currently children need to wait about five seconds before that button appears. Um, and as they get more proficient at stopping and thinking, we could reduce that time. If they then stop engaging in those behaviors, we could increase it. And when they've mastered it, we could reduce it altogether. And finally, maybe reduce or fade away those visual cues altogether to transition them towards engaging in these behaviors uh, you know, in a real world context, at, which is ultimately um, the goal of the stop and think intervention. So thank you. I'm, I'm very sorry that I was over time by about a minute or so.